This is Functionally Illiterate. I'm Ryan. And I'm Zach. And today, we are covering Le Mort de Arthur. That's right. We We should tell the audience what that is. Uh, It is The Death of Arthur by Sir Thomas Mallory. Kind of. of. uh, Well, (laughs) in a sense. uh, Who was English, despite the French name. Yes. Um... I guess they just his publisher thought it sounded fancier. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it's it's been confusing. My wife gave me a little bit of the history of this. So, for those of you who have been uh, listening and paying attention, uh, if you listen to our Celtic mythology episode, we may have mentioned in that one that a lot of the Celtic gods, a lot of the Celtic myths were... Uh, reappropriated into what we now know as Arthurian legend. So a lot of influences come from that, mixed with Christianity, uh, mixed with... So those stories, they started telling them around 900, and they published a book in France called The Vulgate Cycle. A few years after that, there was a drastic rewrite of it called the post-Vulgate cycle. And then sometime in the 1200s, that's when enter Thomas Mallory, and he writes Le Morte de Arthur, which is basically an English Christianized version of the Vulgate cycle. My wife recommends that we should have read the Vulgate cycle instead. By the by. Well, there, <laughs> if I were to choose between the two, personally, I would have picked the post-Vulgate. But... Um, for the sake of not breaking my brain, trying to read Middle English. Yeah. Um, so this I have, is already... I have instead gone with... Uh, let me double check. This is the Bramall House publishing version of La Morte de Arthur, uh, rendered in modern idiom by Keith Baines. Um, mine... Is the product of standard ebooks, which was free. Uh, they just they took Le Morte Arthur and they put it in a uh, in a format that was conducive to reading on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder if your version, how closely to the post Vulgate so, Vulgate that it really is. Well, it has an introduction and a preface and a big uh, and a bibliographical note. Mm. So, basically, there was this guy, uh, Caxton, uh, and Caxton took all of it and tried to make it a bit more legible while staying as true to Mallory's writing as possible, which is conveyed because I can read it. You know, I understand that it's English. It's just there's a lot of words that I've never encountered before. And mm-hmm. there's language structure that's confusing at times, yeah. which is exacerbated by the archaic words. Like, literally, the amount of times that I would just pop in a word into Google and followed by the words archaic meaning. Like, I was mm-hmm. doing that constantly just so I could understand what I was yeah. reading. Which... I have just a list of archaic words that I can get into later and what those words mean. Yeah. I What I found interesting was just that if you look at it without really trying to read it, the Middle English seems so foreign and alien and strange. Mm-hmm. But if you were to just, as a native English speaker, phonetically pronounce the words, you'll recognize 90% of them. Yeah. You like, know, like you'll see L-Y-F-F. And you're like, I, that's not a word. Well, it's life. It's life. It's just life. It's just life. Yeah. Same but thing. That's with, every word. Yeah. Same there's with a lot of war, random war. G's and Y's thrown in. You're like, I don't understand what that word is, just because it doesn't look familiar. But if you just, if you're hooked on phonics, <laughs> you'll get it. Yeah. Because um, there's in this there are there's certain things that they that uh, Keith Baines has left rendered in the original. Or as close to, I suppose, as yeah, you could so find the original, like the inscription on the the anvil and the sword and the stone. So we should get into how my version is formatted differently than yours. Yes. You're that, reading a physical book. That has book. been uh, an issue with 
which will become less of an issue once we get into more modern books. But as we're in the older books still, um, with mythology, it wasn't as big an issue because we weren't covering the same stories. And so it didn't matter if we had different versions slightly yeah. because I was telling a different story than you were. So we were only getting your version of that story anyway. Yeah. Um, and but, we compared if we encountered the same right. stories. But this is a little but with different. this, it's we're trying to read the same story. And we're not. And they're not quite the same we, story. We were discussing before we started recording and figured out, oh, actually, there are a few little differences in how the stories are told. Uh, like in what happens, mm -hmm. which we'll get into that when we get to, into that. Um, but yeah, so mine is formatted very simply book one through uh, 21. And every chapter is marked with a Roman numeral. Right. And then there's a little blurb basically saying like what was discussed in the chapter, which I sent you those blurbs. Mm -hmm. I hope you got yep. a kick out of those. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting descriptions. Um, and so as I'm telling uh, what I read, I'm going to quote those blurbs because mm -hmm. I feel like they do very succinctly sum up what each chapter was about. Yeah. It's... I, I don't know how common that was back then. I've never really encountered that. Obviously, that's not a thing that really happens uh, in today's publishing. But literacy today is not anywhere near what literacy was in the 13th or 14th century, so... True, like, you know, people in the church had to read to everybody. Yeah. Like, that so, was why everybody went to Mass, I feel so like, I wonder, story time. I wonder what the purpose of the, the sort of abstract at the beginning is. And I don't, I don't have an answer for well, that. Well, maybe it's simply because it allows you to just know what chapter you're looking at. Like, if you're looking for a specific chapter yeah, yeah. and you just want to read a little blur... Yeah, because it doesn't have a chapter title, does it? It's just the Roman numerals. It's just Roman numeral 1, 2, etc., followed by a little blur. So. And then the actual chapter itself. Okay, so that it takes the place of sort of a chapter title, I guess. Yeah, which I find amusing, honestly. I also think that's pretty, that's pretty funny. And, I, and I'll get into why <laughs> I think it's amusing. But, um. <laughs> How's yours so, formatted? So the way mine's formatted, it really seems it's mostly formatted, uh, formatted towards characters. Mm -hmm. And so I read, this is broken down into the tale of King Arthur, the tale of King Arthur and the Emperor Lucius, the tale of Sir Lancelot, the tale of Sir Gareth, the book of Sir Tristram, Tristram, uh, the tale of the Sangreal, which is the, the Holy Grail. Oh, okay. Um, the book of Lancelot and Guinevere, and then the final section is La Mort de Arthur, which would be the ending. But each section of it seems to be um, aimed at either a very specific event or a very specific character. And so within the tale of King Arthur, the first part is just titled Merlin. And it covers everything Merlin did, more or less, from the time he met Uther Pendragon to the time spoilers, he's betrayed and trapped in a cave. Yeah, which I found interesting because mine doesn't do that at all. Mine just kind of more or less tells it in chronological order. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot in Merlin's chapter that I do know, but there's also a little bit there that hasn't been covered in my version yet. Yeah, and so... Which, whatever. So the, the six sections that uh, follow in my The Tale of King Arthur, we have Merlin... Uh, Balin, or the Knight with Two Swords, uh, Tor and Pelennor, the War with the Five Kings, Arthur and Echelon, and Gawain, Ewain, and Marhouse. So those are sort of the... Those are what those sections that's, are called. That's what I have thus far covered in oh. La Morte d'Arthur. Yeah. Um, and like I said, some of it isn't... It's not all strictly chronological. There's some things that happened before, like... Merlin participates in the war with the five kings. So even though in the first section uh, about Merlin, the end of that section, he is trapped in the cave. The war of five kings happens before that happens. You just read it after you've read that. Mm -hmm. So it's a little confusing. And at no point does it try to clarify very well when these things happen. Yeah, I mean, there might be a sentence or two that was like, and then Merlin gave this advice, and you go, oh, so Merlin was there. Yeah. 
There was gotcha. A, there was a lot of instances where you know what actually i'm gonna just get into that let's just get into it all right you let's know do it. let's stop talking about it and talk about it so chapter one in my book first how uther pendragon sent for the duke of cornwall and to grain his wife and of their departing suddenly again so simply put there is this guy uther pendragon he was king of all of england he was warring with a duke in Cornwall, the Duke of Tintagil, mm -hmm. for a long time. So now, the way they word this, I'm really confused on if they had been warring, and for whatever reason, Uther decided to invite the duke to his castle, or if the warring happened because of what happened when he invited the duke to his castle. My understanding is that they were already... Maybe not actively warring, but at the very least had a contentious relationship. Okay, so... And so the invitation to the castle was under the premise of a parlay. potential peace treaty. Yeah. Well, so that happens. Mm -hmm. he, invites, he invites the Duke of Tintagel. The Duke of Tintagel brings his wife with him, Agrae. Uther Pendragon is a bastard. And I mean that in the metaphorical sense. I'm pretty sure he... Yes, he is there's going to be a lot of literal bastards. So, <laughs> important to know, Uther Pendragon, as far as we are aware, is the legitimate child of his parents. But he's a fucking bastard. <laughs> but he is a dick. So he, <laughs> so, he invites them, and he entertains them for a bit, and then he attempts to seduce a grain. And a grain rebuffs him, and goes to her husband, and is like, well, I suppose the only reason we were invited was so that... Uther could get with me. And so, naturally, they leave. And they don't tell anybody that they're leaving. And so then Uther's people tell him that they left. Naturally, he gets pissed. But yeah. the way they phrase it, I love the phrase, it was, it was Uther was wonderly wroth. And I was like, oh, man, what does that mean? I they looked it up. They don't write like that anymore. <laughs> no, they sure don't. And he's like, he was mad as all hell. He was like, how, do you, how dare she leave? I wanted to have sex with her. So the nerve of that woman. <laughs> so he goes, to, he goes to his council, and his council is like, well, you should call him back. And if they don't come back, you should threaten him with war. And so that's what he did. He threatened the duke to be ready and stuffed and garnished. For in 40 days, he would fetch the duke out of the biggest castle that he had. In response, the duke furnished two of his castles, Tintagil and Terrabil. So he put his wife in Castle Tintagil, and he put himself in Castle Terrabil. The warring proceeds. The warring goes on for some amount of time that is not specified. And Uther gets sick, and the way they describe it, he gets sick out of just the pure anger that he has for the warring mm -hmm. and for his unrequited love of a yes. grain. He is lovesick. <laughs> now, <laughs> just as, as a side note, Thomas Mallory does not spend uh, really any time discussing tactics of battles. He really doesn't. Uh, it's, most of it's going to come down to this night, unhorsed this night, or slayed this night, yep. and then this guy helped him back up onto his horse. You know that it, yep. it's going to be most of it. That's what I put um, in my notes. <laughs> it's Im important to remember that in all these battles, there are common infantry, there are foot soldiers, there are conscripted peasants There's that are knights. just being slaughtered there, yeah. all over the place. So much slaughtering. Um, and but you can pick out hints of tactics if you pay attention to the events, and one of these is here when. Uther's threatening him. He's like, you know, find your biggest castle and I'll get you out of it. And the Duke of Cornwall is like, well, <laughs> I have more than one castle, big guy. And so he mans two of them. Now, I didn't look up the geography of this and it, it might not even be real geography. So it might not make any sense even if I tried. But the position that he puts Uther in is actually not a very good position for Uther. He's kind of stuck because yeah. on the one hand, um, he wants revenge on the Duke for spurning him and leaving without announcing. Yeah. So you're like, well, I got to take the Duke. And you would assume the Duke is a more competent military leader than his wife. Yeah. So that's the castle you want to attack. However, 
in medieval times. A lot of the times, the wives of lords functioned as managers of castles. That was sort of their day-to-day life, was making sure that everything was stocked and provisioned and, you know, managing the workforce of the castle itself. Yeah, something that I've picked up on with these older marriages is that the women... You know, the lordly women, they were often administrators, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like and and it wasn't uncommon for women to for to go with their husbands, like that were officers in battle to be their admin in yeah. the war camps. Yeah. So it's like you you, the husband, can focus on the literal battle, the mm-hmm. physicality of the fight. I, the wife, would then sit back and make sure the logistics of the battle were taken care of, that we have all of the bandages and the medicine and the rations and all that stuff that we need, that the laundry is being done for the entire regiment, that there's food being made for everybody. Like, they weren't, as is often pictured sometimes, helpless damsels. They do talk about damsels. They, there are helpless damsels. They exist. They were not generally the wives of lords. <laughs> <laughs> they were the daughters of lords, often, unmarried. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you were a, a noble woman, you had a job. It was a thankless, rough job, but it was a job. Um, and so if he attacks the Duke of Cornwall, I mean, there's a fully manned castle, presumably not that far away, that he opens up his flanks to that could be attacked. And now his wife isn't going to you know, charge in there leading the troops, but there's got to be an officer in charge of the castle no, somewhere. Yeah, I mean, so you could be flanked. Yeah. But the Duke also knows that his real goal is his wife. So if he goes to the wife, now the Duke can flank him from his castle. Yeah. So that the strategic value of a castle is it's massive. And by forcing Uther to pick one or the other, he puts him in a really tough spot mm-hmm. as to whether which force is going to be able it's to flank him. It's implied he can't really divide his troops. Right. Yeah. It's it, he can't outright win in this case. Yeah. And that's both tactically sound and narratively a good idea. Well, so yeah, so they're warring for a while. Thank you, Zach. Yeah. Uh, they're warring for a while, and he's sick. He's love sick, and he's angry, and he's you know he's falling ill. And uh, one of his knights, Sir Ulfius, who remember that name, Sir Ulfius asks him, "Hey, you know what's wrong?" And the king tells him what's wrong. You know, just he's honest about it. He's like, "There's I." I'm in love with the grain and I want her. And he's like, all right, um, well, I will go seek out Merlin then. I'm confident he can help you. And so then he goes on an untold adventure. He finds Merlin, isn't aware that he meets Merlin, and they have a funny little interaction. Mm -hmm. And Merlin's like, all right, tell you what, if King Uther can fulfill my desires, then I will fulfill his desires. Uh, The spirit of his desires. All right, and so then, uh, you know, Ulfius is like, okay, well, that seems fair. And so then they go back to King, to King Pendragon, and Merlin tells Pendragon the same thing. Pendragon agrees, and <laughs> so Merlin is like, okay, here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to disguise you to look like the Duke of Tentagel. I'm going to disguise Sir Ulfius to look like Sir Brastius, one of uh, the knights of the Duke. And I'm going to disguise myself as Sir Jordanus, another knight of the Dukes. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go into his castle, and you're going to pretend... You're going to fake illness. You know, don't really talk to anybody. Just uh, pretend you're unwell, and you need the comfort of your wife. And then you can go and do your thing. You know, the thing where you have sex with a married woman under false pretenses. That thing. (laughs) In exchange, when this happens, you are going to have a child with a grain. It is my request that when this child is born, this child is mine now to do with as I please. And Uther agrees. It it is uh, a very common trope and... The fact that it appears here leads me to believe that it has been a very common trope for a very, 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 very long, long time. time. <laughs> the payment of the firstborn. <laughs> he literally asked for a firstborn child. And this is this is one of those little parts of the characterization of Merlin that I 
find very interesting because Merlin is usually the good guy. You, Merlin sure. is not always good. Yeah. <laughs> In this instance, he's literally helping a king rape a woman so that he can kidnap their then baby. Yep. And you're like, this doesn't seem good. Yep. Now, in hindsight, you get to say, well, it's good because it's Arthur Pendragon. Mm. I don't know Okay, about that. but then we're getting into an ends justifies means argument, and that's never a good place to end up. Well, anyway, so, so... <laughs> it's just it's one of those moments where you get to see Merlin as the morally gray force that he is. He is not only a force for good. He's behaving like a hack. Yes. It's, <laughs> it's, it's straight up. It's it's very and apt given that this is a Christian man yeah. writing a story based on pagan myth that Merlin being sort of the personification of pagan, pagan magic yeah. is this not always benevolent force. Yeah. So, so, you know, Merlin tells them that and they're like, Oh, this is a great plan. And so, yeah, Merlin uses his magic to disguise the three of them they make their way towards, uh, shoot, which castle was it? Uh, Tentagil. Tentagil, yeah. Mm-hmm. So they make their way over to Castle Tentagil. And the Duke sees this. He sees these three going that way. The way I interpreted it, you know, because it's archaic wording, but the way I interpreted it is he saw himself and he was like, wait a minute, and he went and attacked, right? And then, so yeah, he attacks himself. And Uther wins. And not three hours after his death was when Uther Pendragon begat Arthur with, uh, with uh, Igraine. Begat meaning conceived the child. Mm-hmm. So, so in this in this version, uh, the Duke of Cornwall sees Uther leave. Mm-hmm. Not disguised. They're not disguised yet. Oh, I see. And so he sees that as a moment of weakness for his army. He's like, oh, their leader is gone. He sees Merlin. Merlin leaves with him. One of their best knights. He's like, oh, this is a, this is a great moment. Their leadership is out of the way. Now I perform this Sally attack. Like, we're going to go do some raids. And he dies in the process of that. Okay. So there's no direct confrontation with Uther. And so then uh, he's dead. Uther goes, disguises himself as the Duke, has sex with Ingrain, conceives Arthur, and then leaves, and her then, not knowing anything different. Well, shortly afterwards... Until after. Shortly afterwards, she she does know different. She discovers, oh my God, my husband's dead. Wait a minute, who did I have sex with? Right, I know I didn't have sex she, with my husband. She finds out that he would have been dead hours before she saw him yeah. and had lain with him. Mm-hmm. And so she keeps that to herself. So, yeah, um, Uther, after this has all happened, he still is in love with Egraine, Mm -hmm. and he begs Ulfius to go to Egraine on his behalf and, you know, to court her, and so he does, and Egraine consents. Uh, I'm getting the impression she didn't really have much of a choice in the matter. Well, I think you got to put it in... In a bit of perspective from a grain standpoint, um, her husband's dead. Yeah. She is now not even technically a lady anymore. Yeah. She's just a widow. And the last thing she remembers really doing before finding out this news was having sex with someone that she thought was her husband. That wasn't. Now she's like, I don't, maybe I had a vision. Like maybe this was a, a weird mystical experience. Don't know. Now, it also doesn't necessarily point out if she's aware of the fact that she's pregnant or not. However, my experience with pregnant women is that they are aware far sooner than anyone else. Well, so in- I would be inclined to believe if this were a historical account. Yeah. Ingrain would know that she was pregnant and would probably be pretty anxious to be married. So, so she doesn't not have a to, bastard. Well, a bastard or best case scenario, a legitimate but still fatherless child. Mm-hmm. And so then this king, who's not directly responsible for your husband's death, because remember, he wasn't there when it happened. Right. Uh, still loves you. 
and he's the high king of England, and he's yeah. saying, I'll marry you. If I were a woman in that time, pregnant with a child that I don't know where it came from, and was terrified of living a life of poverty, I might take that deal. As I said, not much of a choice in the matter. Right. Um, well, so... It, they don't address it here, but later they address it and say that a grain wed Uther Pendragon 13 days mm -hmm. after her husband's death, which yeah. I, I personally, I don't think that's enough time for her to know that she's pregnant yet. <laughs> Probably <laughs> not. Um, but regardless, so the next chapter, oh, I'm sorry, that was chapter two, all where so, like the whole, the shenanigans. So one thing that I think is important to remember is that Merlin orchestrated these events very specifically. Yes, he did. Because he's a prophet. It's, yeah. it's said often. He he's knows a prophet. He's a, he's a necromancer. He's a druid. He's the son of a devil. He's all these things. And he wears that dorky blue cloak with stars that you That's picture. That's right. Every time. Every if time. If you want to know why every wizard wears a dorky cloak with stars, it's because of Merlin. Merlin. Um, but... The reason it is orchestrated as such is because the way it works out, Arthur is not a bastard. Mm -hmm. Because the Duke was dead before Uther and Ingrain had sex. Yeah. So she was not a married woman. She was a widow. She didn't know it, but she was. And then they were married and then because before they were Arthur married was born. Before Ingrain was publicly known to be pregnant, nobody could doubt that it happened prior to their wedding. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so that was chapter two, which the book sums up as how Uther Pendragon made war on the Duke of Cornwall and how by the mean of Merlin, he lay by the Duchess and gat Arthur. Hi, this is Functionally Literate. Hope you've been enjoying listening. This episode is brought to you by me. I made this show. I'm Ryan. I'm broke. If you could donate a little money my way with a sponsorship or a product, like, I'll be a shill for money. Um, and I'm going to use that money with which to buy books. Because let me tell you, right now I'm checking stuff out of the library and it's rough. You can email me at funk.lit.pod at gmail.com. That is F-U-N-C dot L-I-T dot P-O-D at gmail dot com. You could also be a patron of this podcast. That's right. This podcast, Functionally Literate, we're going places. We have a Patreon now. You can give me a dollar. And in exchange, you will be able to listen to this podcast ad-free. That means right now, you don't have to listen to this bit. You can listen to the podcast uninterrupted. It just goes without me going on about things that you don't care about. Just for a buck. And that will increase in value every two weeks because there will be another ad-free episode. Additionally, if you'd like to just pitch a little money my way, like you don't, you're not interested in being a patron, you can uh, go to my PayPal, which is also in there. I made a Funklet PayPal. It's, it'll, it'll all be in the description. Links all, all the links in the description. Now we're on to chapter three of the birth of King Arthur and of his nature. So. Egraine's pregnancy obviously became more and more pronounced. Uh, in her sixth month, Uther asked her who the father was. He already knew the answer, of course. Well, yeah, I mean, he was but, there. <laughs> so Egraine tells the truth of the story as she knew it, right? You mm -hmm. know, she, ex she explained that someone who looked like her husband but wasn't and people who looked like his knights but weren't, they came to Tentagill. And so, you know, she slept with him as she ought to do with her lord, the way she put it. Mm -hmm. And then Uther, I'm paraphrasing here, Uther's like, this is the truth, for it is I who did the deed, and this is why I did it. And then the queen made great joy when she knew who was the father of her child. Yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> she was so happy to learn the sequence of events that played out. Uh, I think there is to be expected here, again, if this were a historical account, some, 
some bittersweet relief. Maybe yeah. not joy, but imagine you just married the High King of England. I don't want to. You're pre- you're <laughs> pregnant, and it's tough because we're guys. But you're pregnant. You just married the High King of England, and he says, "Whose baby is that?" And you take a huge risk, huge both for yourself risk. and your child, telling him the truth, mm-hmm. because. No one could tell the High King no if he said, oh, that's not mine. And then as soon as it was born, he just chucks it off a cliff. Mm -hmm. Because he's like, well, that's I can't have him having a succession argument with my true heir. So she takes a big risk saying, I don't actually know. I know it isn't you because it was a guy that looked like my husband and you don't. Yeah. And so in a way, she's sort of rewarded for that honesty by Uther going... Yes, that actually was me, so you don't need to fear for your own life or the life of your child because he's also mine, and that's yeah. what I wanted to happen. Mm. So it's... Joy would is definitely... This is written by you know a nobleman who's like, of course the woman would be so happy to find out her son is the heir to the throne. <laughs> right. And it's like, probably a little more nuanced than that. But, I would like to think. But yeah. I bet she's not the most upset she's ever been. I like your interpretation, but I feel like there's no way this woman is happy. There is no way. (laughs) Happiness has to be uh, put in its context. Her husband's dead, only has been for six months. She's already remarried. She's being interrogated by this new husband as to the origin of her baby. So... So soon after this conversation, Merlin comes and he says it's time to prepare for the arrangements of the child. Yes, Rumpelstiltskin coming to get his prize. And so Merlin says to Uther that Uther has a lord, Sir Ector. He is the lord of many parts of England and Wales. So he tells Uther to send for him and to hear him out and to learn to love him as he loves you. And... That he will send, that Sir Ector will send his own baby to another woman to love as their own. So when your baby is born, give it to me, unchristened, don't baptize this child, just give it to me. And so, you know, this all plays out the way Merlin said it would, and Uther plays along. And Merlin takes the baby to Ector. Um, hold on, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. So, yes, yeah, Sir Ector comes to to Uther's castle and yeah, they get along really well. Mm-hmm. You know, it turns out Uther Pendragon likes Sir Ector. Mm-hmm. And so he gives him a bunch of, you know, great rewards. I look at this as kind of like a dowry, only there's no wedding involved. Mm-hmm. It's, and, it's more to ensure the inheritance of his son. Yeah. It's like, you're going to get my kid, so I'm going to give you all the stuff, make sure you're well off. Yeah. Cause then my son will be well off. So yeah. So all that happens. Uh, the baby's born. Merlin takes the baby Gives the baby to Ector. Well, no. The baby was given to two knights and two ladies who delivered it to Ector. Mm -hmm. Who then christened the child Arthur and his wife breastfed him. Mm -hmm. That that is the important thing to remember. That's why, one of the reasons, why Ector was a good choice. His wife was already pregnant. Yeah. And was going to deliver her baby around the same time as Arthur. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have formula. So if you couldn't breastfeed, it was basically bread and water. Which is why they specified that bit where Sir Ector and his wife are giving up their own child to raise Arthur. Because arguably you couldn't reliably breastfeed two. You could only breastfeed one baby. I mean, I guess. I don't, don't, I'm not, I am in no way uh, an OBGYN. I don't know anything (laughs) about this. I'm going to assume that the female body will make enough milk for the babies it knows it has. <laughs> All right. You know, you know what? Maybe, sure. I'll take maybe, it. maybe you could breastfeed more than one. I don't know. Maybe the act of trying to breastfeed will increase the milk production. I have no idea. Well, anyways, this is how it played this out. This is a fantasy story, so it doesn't matter. Chapter four <laughs> of the death of King Uther Pendragon. So, pretty straightforward. Two years after this happened, Uther got sick. He fought another war. Um, he won, but like as he was winning the war, like he fell deathly ill. They had to take him back on a horse litter. Uh, so you know he won, sure, but he got really sick. And uh, you know over the next few days, you know the barons they were really concerned. They turned to Merlin, 
They didn't know what to do. So Merlin goes to Uther Pendragon and asks him if Arthur would be his successor. And, you know, kind of gets into why he needs Arthur to be the successor. Although that's not explained to us at this time. And so Uther agrees. He gives his consent and his blessing. And then he died. And then Egrain and all of his barons wept. So now here is where things get interesting, right? Because this is kind of reminiscent, or at least to me it was, of Game of Thrones mm-hmm. when uh, when the king got, you know, King Robert, he got, you know, gutted by a, a mm-hmm. boar or something. Mm-hmm. And on his deathbed, he had Ned Stark write his letter of like who his successor was to be. In that... A dead king's word doesn't mean much. Yeah. One of, one of the important things about that that sort of dying wish of Uther was that Merlin had the barons there. Mm-hmm. Because no one but Merlin and Uther and Ingrain knew anything about Arthur. Right. Or where he was. And so it was important for Merlin later to have the barons around be like, you heard him say that. It's not just me. Because otherwise later, you know, Arthur shows up and Merlin's like, that's the king's son. And everybody goes, you say, but like, who the fuck are you? And even so, Merlin needed to act quickly Mm -hmm. after this happened, after the king died. So what he did, he went to the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is like the other side of the authoritative coin here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The, The king is the secular leader the Archbishop of Canterbury is the religious leader in yeah. England at this time. So he goes to the Archbishop and he's like, listen, you need to summon all of the lords of the kingdom and and the gentlemen of arms and all of them. You need to summon them here to London. They need to be here by Christmas. So we can so we can all witness a miracle of the king. And the Archbishop is like, okay, and he makes it so. And so, yeah, everyone well, yeah, comes If I'm to the London. Archbishop of Canterbury and someone shows up and says, you want to see a miracle? I'm like, I'm down. Right. I do want to see a miracle. Yeah. That would be awesome, actually. <laughs> so, so <laughs> what yeah. do I got to do? Yeah, I'll make that happen. So in the greatest church of London, which they do not name, I, I thought that was interesting here because what Mallory wrote in here was, the French book maketh no mention. So he, he was saying the Vulgate cycle didn't specify which yeah. church was the greatest church of all of them. I'm going to flip through my pages here while you keep talking to see if it mentions it in my... Yeah. I don't think it does, but... So all of these uh, lords of these estates, they prayed at first mass of... Uh, you know, the first mass of the day of Christmas. Obviously, you have more than one mass at Christmas. It does specify St. Paul's Cathedral. Interesting. Your book specifies St. Paul's Cathedral. Mm-hmm. It is in parentheses. It says the archbishop held his service in the city's greatest church, St. Paul's. Okay. So Thomas Mallory said it made no mention. Somebody else decided it was Someone St. Paul's. else has decided you're in London. The greatest church in London must be. <laughs> it, it could be that when the Vulgate was written... It was sort of this thing you didn't have to specify. Mm. You know, like if you're like the greatest church in Paris. I mean, until very recently, we all knew which one that was. It was Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. Now it's the saddest church in Paris, but... Remind me why? It caught fire. Oh, no. Yeah, and they're just like the... It's a big mess. It's irrelevant, but it's... there's They're never going to be able to repair it. I see. Well, so... Anyways, circling back. So at St... Paul's mm-hmm. Cathedral, um, they, this is where the sword and the stone was. In the churchyard of St. Paul's, there was a massive stone on top of which, no, sorry, there was a high altar with a giant massive stone on top of the altar. Mm-hmm. And on top of the stone, there was an anvil. In the anvil, you probably all know this, was the sword and the stone. I think it's interesting that often in the story of the sword and the stone, the anvil gets omitted. Yeah. It's usually just the sword is right into the rock. Yeah. But here they specify that this sword was in an anvil, and on top of the anvil was 
uh, written in gold letters, Whoso pulleth out this sword of this stone and anvil is right wise king born of all England. And everyone marveled at this thing. And the archbishop was like, now nobody mess with this until after high mass is over. Mm-hmm. And so they respected that. They waited until high mass was over. And then after that, lots of people tried to draw well, the sword. Lining it up. Just, just trying just, to get that sword out. I, I, I'm reminded of that scene in Thor 1 where everybody's everybody, trying to pick up the hammer. Yeah, yeah, right. And everyone's failing. So, yeah. So nobody can pick this thing up. And so after that, the archbishop decreed that 10 knights would be its keeper and that every New Year's Day, the barons would host a tournament and they would joust in a churchyard, so ordained to keep the peace between the lords and the commons. The commons meaning the commoners, as in the everyday people. Mm -hmm. So the chapter's not over. So presumably, like, years later, else Arthur would have been two years old, um, on one such New Year's Day, Arthur, his adopted father, and Sir Kay, his adopted brother, they went to attend this tournament. So now Kay, he had recently been knighted. That's mm-hmm. why he was going yes. to this he tournament. He is now Sir Kay. He is Sir Kay. Arthur is not Sir Arthur. No, he's he just a Arthur. squire. <laughs> he, and, and they don't specify how old he is, but I'm, I feel like he's like 14 or 15 here. Yeah, that would be around the time you're you're probably as a young knight you're getting knighted. Yeah. You know, you're starting to get a little bit of chin stubble maybe. Yeah. You're you're not quite the strongest you could be, but you're starting to get almost as strong and as a man. Arthur is oblivious. He yes. thinks that he is Ector's son and that Kay is his brother. He has yes. no idea that he's adopted. Mm-hmm. And so so they're on their way to this tournament. Sir Kay realizes, shit, I forgot my sword. Arthur's like, I'll go get it. He runs back to the estate to go get it, but nobody's there. Probably mm-hmm. because they're all going to the tournament, right, too. They're going to be at the tournament. <laughs> so he has no way of recovering Sir Kay's sword. So he's like, oh, I know. I'll get that sword in the stone. Yeah. <laughs> and he well, got- <laughs> you got to think, he's, he's living this life where he's the second born. Mm-hmm. He's assuming, he's probably in his head assuming he's a bastard. Because mm-hmm. he's like, I don't know who my mom is. I mean, it's Lady Ector, maybe, but maybe not. He's he's destined to be a squire. Yeah. You know, he's like, K is the knight. Yeah. I'm just the baggage boy. That's always going to be my life. Mm-hmm. He's sent to go get the, the thing squires do, fetch my stuff. Yeah. And he's, he's this close to failing. <laughs> he's just like, I can't, the doors are locked. What am I going to do? I'm going to let down K. I'm going to let down my father. I can't let that happen. The first sword he thinks of, oh shit, that one at the church. And he runs to go yeah. get it. Yeah. Doesn't think anything, just grabs it, yanks it out, runs back. Yeah. So then, yeah, he he goes to the churchyard. Nobody's there, right? As, the people... as someone that suffers from tunnel vision, I <laughs> relate to Arthur. <laughs> I did. I would not have read anything. I'd have just been like, yoink, I'm out. I mean, I don't <laughs> even. I don't even know if he can read. They never say he can. Well, you assume he's. The son of a lord. He probably I, learned to read. I would kind hope of. so. Well, kind of. Well, he didn't read that, and he no. apparently knows nothing about like how this sword works because <laughs> it doesn't even occur to him that he couldn't take it out of the stone. Yeah, he does, and he brings it to Kay, and Sir Kay, he knows what this sword is. Yeah, and so he goes to his daddy. He's like, Sir Hector, I'm king of all of England. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I pulled out the sword, Dad. It's and, me. And so, I'm king. Sir Hector sees this and he's like, "All right, now you tell me the truth. Where did you get this sword?" And he's like, "Sir Arthur gave it to me." Not Sir Arthur. Arthur gave it to me. He's not a sir. You're right. And so Sir Hector goes to Arthur and he's like, "All right, now you tell me the truth. How did you get him about this sword?" And Sir Arthur's like, "Not Sir Arthur. He's, not, he's just Arthur right now. Squire Arthur is like." <laughs> I pulled it out of the stone. And he's like, you tell me the truth. I did. He's like, okay. Was anybody else there? No. He's like, okay. Let's go. I'll go to the churchyard. They all go to the churchyard. He's like, Kay, put the sword in the stone. Kay does. Kay tries to pull it out. He can't. Yeah. And so then he tells Arthur to pull it out of the stone. And of course he does. Mm -hmm. Now we get into chapter six. How King th- Arthur pulled I, out the sword multiple times. I like this moment, though, between 
sort of and and one thing I've noticed with every version of this I've I've looked into because I've I've looked online at other versions sure. of this and and seems to be fairly consistent. So I think it's Thomas Mallory's writing style is that he bounces between this sort of dry narration of events that's just sort of like listing things in the order that they happened and then dialogue. And then these like very eloquent well-written scenes, personal moments between characters. And mm-hmm. this is one of my favorite between Hector and Kay and Arthur. Yeah. Because Hector knows. Yeah, he does. You know, Hector knows who Arthur is. He knows Arthur's probably going to be the one that pulls the sword out of the stone. Yeah. And so Kay shows up and he's like, Dad, 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 I got the sword. And it could have been so easy for Hector to be like, Sick, you're the king now. <laughs> and just let it go. He could have just let it go and be like, oh, my son is the king. My lineage now sits on the throne of England. Yeah. And it's amazing. But, and he knows his son is lying. He knows he is. He's like, there's no fucking way that kid pulled that out. So yeah. he asked, tell me the truth. Yeah. So he's already removed his own temptation. He's beaten his own temptation to yeah. let it slide. Yeah. Now he's challenging Kay to do the same. He's like, no, tell me the truth. And Kay does it too. He's like, nah, you're right. Here's the so truth. You, you forgive Kay a little bit for being the liar that he was. Because it's because immediately called Because he immediately out. recants. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And it's like, how many of us would be in a position to be like, we could totally get away with this. And someone was like, be honest though. And you gave up this great thing you could have had just for the sake of honesty. Man, I don't know. But I that's do a, know that K is also probably a, a not much older than Arthur himself. No, they're, they're about so, the same age. You know, I buy it. Um, and so he tries, and then he's like, no, nah, okay. So you see this, this characterization of Hector and K as honest men. K, immature, but still honest enough to for his fault. age. To a fault. Um, that he's like, okay, yeah, you're, it was Arthur. And then even then, Hector telling Arthur's like, now you have to be honest. Even though he knows Arthur is being honest, he's still challenging him. He's treating him the same way he would treat Kay. Which is important characterization for just like what their family dynamic is. Yes. And that's why I really like these little moments is because it's easy when it's like, and then Sir Kay unhorsed this guy and then killed these Ugh. guys. And then this, he was unhorsed by oh, this guy. Hey, we'll, you, we'll get into you that. You like lose this idea of like, I, why do I keep caring about Sir Kay? And then you get these little moments where you're like, man, I really like Sir Kay. <laughs> like I get it. He could have like, I could be King dad. I'm King. Yeah. He's like, are you really? Then he goes, nah, you're right. I'm not, but wouldn't it be cool? It was actually Arthur. Arthur totally got it. <laughs> So, yeah, Arthur pulled the sword from the stone, and his father figured it out. And so then we get probably one of the most amusing chapters of the story to me, which <laughs> nobody is... Nobody believes it. Nobody <laughs> believes for a second that pipsqueak, low-born Arthur pulled shit out of a stone. Yeah. And that's, that's where we sort of get into the trope the, of, of the hero in the second family. Yeah. You know, it's like... We haven't gotten into Abrahamic myth at all, but Moses mm-hmm. floating down the Nile, born of low-born Hebrew family, mm-hmm. adopted by Egyptian royalty. You have, I mean, all there's all kinds of stories. I mean, this is, and it gets mirrored later by Mordred, who is high-born, but then cast out, um, of this idea that the family that you were raised with is not necessarily your true family. Yeah. Um, and that's a trope that you'll see in a, a lot of different stories, but this is probably one of the best examples is taken from royalty, destined to be the high king, put with not necessarily a low family, but a lower family. Yeah. And then you find out that that's not your true family. Yeah. So, well, yeah, that's what happens now is Sir Ector has to uh, explain to Arthur the story of the sword and the stone as he knew it, which is, you know, how Arthur is his adopted son and his biological father was actually Uther Pendragon and how all of this was orchestrated by a man named Merlin. Mm -hmm. And so then, uh, you know, they're talking and Arthur is like, you know, processing all these emotions and, you know, revelations and he's just like, what do I do? And Sir Ector's like, 
All I ask of you is that you name your adopted brother, Sir Kay, Seneschal for all of your lands. Seneschal is like... Hold on. I have, I have it in here. Uh, a Seneschal is the steward of a medieval great house. Mm-hmm. So he basically wants um, <laughs> Sir Kay to be the property manager of London. Yes. It, basically just, hey, don't forget that we were good to you. Yeah. Take care of your brother. Yeah. Because he did right by you. Yeah. And so, yeah, uh, Arthur agrees to it. And the, then the trio, they speak to the archbishop. They, you know, do the whole song and dance for the archbishop. So then the archbishop decrees that on Twelfth Day, which is on... January 5th or 6th, depending on how the count goes. I'm mm-hmm. not Catholic. I don't know. Is it January 5th or 6th? I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. What? All right. I'm not going to sit here and count on my fingers to figure it out. It's one of those days. Yeah. <laughs> Early January. So uh, so the Archbishop decrees, decrees that on 12th day, um, you know, the barons can try to pull the sword from the stump. So they do, and of course they can't, and only Arthur can do it. He shows all of the barons that he can pull the sword. And the barons, all they meant that Arthur, like I said, a boy of no high-born blood, Mm -hmm. shall be governing over them. So they put off establishing Arthur as king until Candlemas, because they want to give everyone the opportunity to pull Mm -hmm. the sword from the stone. Anybody else that can do it. Anyone but this Arthur guy. So they wait until Candlemas, which I don't know what Candlemas is. Can you help me here? Uh, It's not really relevant to the story. It's just another sort of liturgical season. It's like some point in February, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, and this whole time the sword was, as always, guarded by at least five knights at a time. And then, yeah, Candlemas comes... All of the lords try to pull the sword. Once again, only Arthur can pull the sword because it's his sword. And again, the barons and everyone there, they griped about it. And so they were like, we're going to put it off until Easter. So they do this whole thing again at Easter. Everybody tries to pull the sword. More people this time try to pull the sword. They fail. Only Arthur can do it. And they, and once again, all of these barons and all of these lords are griping about the idea of Arthur being king. So they delay again until Pentecost, which is 50 days after Easter. Yes. So this is in May. For context, this started at Christmas. Yes. The New Year's Day it is, tournament. It has w- been, <laughs> by the time Arthur actually gets recognized, it's been about six months. It's been about <laughs> six fucking months. And the only reason he was recognized is because the commons fucking was, they were ready to revolt. They were like, they had enough. They were like, Arthur pulled the sword from the stone. He is our rightful king. Make it happen. And so then everyone, rich or poor. Because you have to imagine, like, while this is going on, there is other nobility vying with their little factions to become the new high king. Yeah. And when that kind of stuff happens, the commoners suffer. Mm -hmm. Because whose fields get burned? Whose houses get sacked? Whose villages get you know, ransacked. It's the nobility hide in their little castles. And, and they, they just get their place. And they move the pawns on the chessboard. Yeah. But it's the, the people that live outside the castle that are getting screwed over. Six months of this. And yeah. finally they're like, we know the guy. Just, just Make fucking him do it. Make to Put the guy in the chair. <laughs> I'm done with this. Well, so... They did, you know. Uh, this, this to me was one of the things that when I was reading it, I was like, there was a really, and this, this granted, this is my Christian opinion, there was a missed opportunity here for a nice little narrative alignment to have his christening be at Easter. To have uh, because Arthur's East, christening? Yes, because Easter is the resurrection of Christ. Sure. It would have made narrative sense from a Christian standpoint to have the king in the form of his son be born again, the true heir, you know, risen from the dead metaphorically on the same day. It would have been very nice and neat. Right. It, yeah. it would have made a lot of narrative sense. So as a Christian, I was like, ah, we missed it. We, uh, <laughs> it could have just been at Easter. Pentecost. That said, <laughs> that said, I wonder how closely that aligns with Celtic pagan holidays. 
I don't know. Would Pentecost, I mean, it is in May, so that does line up fairly close with, uh, depending on exactly where it's been, the summer solstice. Okay. So it's at least approaching. I don't, I mean, it's about as close to that as it is to Easter, but maybe there was some Celtic pagan holiday around then that made narrative sense with that. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, where was I? Yeah, right. So the commoners, they all revolted, basically. Uh, they were like, listen, you make Arthur king, God has willed it so. If you do not make this happen, we are going to slay any who that holdeth against it, was, was the exact yeah. wording. Yeah. Um, like, we're going to kill whoever is not Arthur that tries to sit on that chair. We're sick of this. So then everyone, rich and poor, that delayed Arthur's crowning, they knelt and they cried mercy. And Arthur, you know, naturally forgave them. He'd be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be forgiven her buddy. And so then he was coronated. And then immediately after he was coronated, many complained of injustices sustained since Pendragon's death. Right? Because yep. they haven't had a high king for like 15 years. Mm-hmm. Well, 13 years. Yeah. It's been a long something, time. Something like that. And uh, basically, the complaint was that there were many lands currently lacking in lords, knights, ladies, and gentlemen, because I guess it's the high king that decides all that. Yes. So Arthur declared all those who own the lands be given them. And then right after that, he lives up to his first promise before coronation. He made Sir Kay, Seneschal of England, and then he made Sir Baudwin of Britain constable. And then Sir Ulfius was made Chamberlain, and Sir Brastius was named Warden of the North. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to. Yep. Uh, yeah, so Sir Brastius, he was made literally Warden of the North from Trent forwards. So yep. Trent, I'm guessing, is somewhere kind of in the middle point yep. uh, in in the UK. As far as I understand it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, Ch- the northern uh, part of the island of Britain, or England, I guess, uh, at that point was still fairly unruly. Mm-hmm. While it, it sort of considered itself part of England, it was also like, yeah, but not like the rest of you guys. Like, we're kind of loosely affiliated we respect the High King of England, whether we listen to him or not. It's kind of case by case basis. So it was important to have someone that's like job was to really kind of secure that area to be like, look, at any moment they could kind of just turn on us. Yeah. And we don't want that to happen. Makes sense. So what does a constable do? Oh, man. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. What about a Chamberlain? For, for some reason, constable. And this could 100% be inaccurate. I have connotations of law enforcement. Okay. I want to say it might have something to do with with maintaining order amongst the rabble. He's like the medieval sheriff. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that... So Sir Baudwin is constable. Sir Ulfius is chamberlain. Chamberlain. What does a chamberlain do? Maybe some kind of judge. I don't know. I'd have to look that up. Yeah. Chamberlain. I feel like that's important. Yeah, and Sir Brasius is important under there. So then we get into chapter eight. Shit starts to go down. We thought we had some crazy shit going on. Now we're getting into it. It only gets crazy.